I actually appreciate the opportunity to do this because I think it's such a difficult event to try to integrate his passing. And um, a lot of the ways in which we can do that is to understand and to appreciate his impact professionally and also personally. And I was very fortunate to have known him both professionally and personally. We both arrived in Toronto at roughly the same time and both matured and grew up um, in ways that were both intellectually stimulating and, and personally meaningful. So um, it's, it was, you know, it was very hard, it continues to be hard to integrate the meaning of what happened with Jeremy, but this is a wonderful opportunity to reflect on it. So um, it, it's, it's a weird coincidence. Jeremy and I both competed for the same job in Toronto, which at that time was a position, a fairly high profile position um, at the only cognitive therapy center in Toronto that was established at the Clark Institute for Psychiatry. Brian Shaw was running that clinic, and they were involved with the large Treatment of Depression Collaborative Research Project that NIMH funded with uh, Tim Beck, um, Jerry Clareman, and Myrna Weissman, and um, I think uh, Stuart Stotsky as the psychopharmacology leads. And Toronto was the quality control center for CBT, so we would receive a lot of the videotapes of therapists and using the cognitive therapy scale would need to establish competence of the therapists or provide supervision if they were falling below a competence threshold. So Jeremy was hired for that job and um, I received a fellowship from um, the Canadian government and I used that money to make a pitch to Brian Shaw, even though I didn't get the job, that I could still arrive with my own funding and work in the CBT unit. And so it was a good offer, he accepted. And so Jeremy and I really met there. We both had interests in psychotherapy and he came from somewhat of a different, um, slightly different orientation. And my um, entry into that group was a little bit more sort of straightforward cognitive therapy. Mm -hmm. And so from the beginning, we had both common and divergent interests. But we were both very interested in the whole process of understanding therapy, how it worked. And at that time, we both felt a common bond against what we saw as the hostile forces that were demeaning what we were doing. Uh, one group of people that were hostile to what we were doing were the biological psychiatrists at the Clark Institute of Psychiatry, who understandably thought that psychotherapy could do very little for a biological disorder such as depression. <laughs> and the other side of the kind of hostile environment were very, very uh, old school psychoanalysts, psychodynamic therapists who felt that a therapy delivered via a treatment manual was always going to be very stiff, inflexible, and robotic. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't think there could be a, a better way for us to bond than to feel that we had a common cause that we could promote and advocate for. Uh -huh. and, and while this is happening, how do you remember Jeremy as a person? Uh, do you have any recollection? What were your impressions of him in general? <clears throat> Jeremy, when I first met him, was very, um, he was more productive. His CV was, was stronger. He published more and he'd also worked in contexts that were a little bit more firmly entrenched in psychotherapy than I was. So I remember him as very smart, very quick with concepts and the ability to discuss frameworks from different points of view. And I think my contribution was to be a little bit more dogmatic, methodological, empirical. And he had a little bit of a broader skeptical view of science, but was also able to work within it. And... Um, you know, he had significant uh, co collaborations at that time with Les Greenberg and Laura Rice and perspectives on psychotherapy that were, I think, a bit more eclectic. Mm -hmm. And I just remember that the main points of contact that we had were there is a um, sort of a funky area around the Clark Institute called Kensington Market. Mm -hmm. uh, and we used to go for walks over lunchtime 
um, making sure that we had about an hour. We'd just go for walks. We'd buy some cheese. We'd buy some olives. We'd walk around and we would talk. Often we would argue. Um, and, and those were very intellectually stimulating. And then we also were friends. You know, we would spend time together on the weekends. Uh, we, would, we would do things here and there. And so I found it, you know, easy enough to um, share both of those sort of worlds with him. Mm -hmm. well, but you got me curious. What did you argue about mostly? Um, oh, what we argued about uh, common factors as being uh, entirely uh, sufficient to explain psychotherapy. That was sort of his view, and my view was that absolutely not. <laughs> Especially in uh, you know uh, in anxiety disorders and all of those, um, and um, also some of the more kind of outside ideas that he was trying to bring in because Jeremy had an attachment both to cognitive therapy but I would say his attachment was ambivalent because while he was interested in being part of the cognitive therapy community he also was interested in standing outside the cognitive therapy community so he could voice the criticisms of cognitive therapy and the sort of you know at that point computer models of the mind cognitive processing all of these sort of um, teleological mental models were very popular and I think Les Greenberg and I think others were, were critical of those models to encapsulate how we understand human emotions and emotion processing. <clears throat> and so he would critique cognitive therapy with one foot while having another foot inside the cognitive therapy school. Yeah. So for me it was a little bit uncomfortable because I would push back. Some of these ideas were sort of speculations on his part. And then sometimes there were other, you know, evidence-based studies that he would raise, and I would say, yeah, I guess, you know, I don't understand the whole universe, so I'll have to uh, take what you say and take a look at it. But it was, it was more like that, uh, back and forth. It's so interesting you're saying this because a lot of people know Jeremy as like the Alliance Ruptures researcher or even the psychoanalyst. But oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For a lot of people to actually remember Jeremy the cognitive therapist, while wow, he was never fully, you know, a classic cognitive therapist, this is very interesting. He wasn't, he wasn't. But I remember we went to Philadelphia together for one of the first meetings of the cognitive therapy group with Tim Beck. We went to other meetings and met with Jeff Young and a whole bunch of other people. And he, he would always say to me, you know, the cognitive therapy group, they're always trying to defend themselves against what they imagine to be uh, criticisms. And they always have all of these critiques. And I'm saying, yeah, and eventually they're defending themselves from the things that you're saying about them. Because he was starting to pull things in much more of an interpersonal direction, which eventually led to our book yes. being published, Interpersonal Process and Cognitive Therapy. And even that was a little bit of a kind of departure uh, for cognitive therapists. Right. And he, was able, he was able to hold both of those sides without alienating hmm. the cognitive therapy group. They saw his work as advancing the cause, but also influencing the interpersonal cognitive cycle and interpersonal schemas and things like that. He was right. able to translate it into a way that resonated both with the cognitive therapy group and even with some of the people on the interpersonal side. I actually have the book here. I, I, I've always loved this book and it's, it's funny you're saying that. Yeah, I, it's interesting because even Aaron Beck has a blurb here recommending the book. So yeah, yeah. in some way, that kind of proves it in a way. Exactly. So in some way, it didn't feel like too much of an attack. It seemed more like at least some part of the mainstream cognitive therapy people were into it. Would you agree yeah. to that? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think his skillful way of not um, doing things in order to um, cut the ties with one group. I mean, there are other types of therapy schools in which they are founded on the basis of negating other schools that came before them. And that builds a certain kind of mo movement and maybe momentum. But that wasn't really Jeremy's approach. I think part of his skillfulness was, yes, I'm going to tell you things that are going to uh, stretch and perhaps challenge your model, but he's going to do it in a way that uh, was, was trying to be inclusive. And uh, initially, at least in his time in Toronto, I think that was a feature of how we operated. How do you remember this time of writing this book with him? Because the book, I think made a significant impact in bringing attachment theory into personal process. How was it's, it? it's a crazy story. I don't know if I've told a lot of people this story. We, we were awesome. talking about the book. Should we write a book? And he wasn't sure. And sometimes he was sure. 
sometimes I think he thought like he didn't need me to write the book and what, what was I contributing? Um, and then sometimes we would, you know, he thought, yes, this would be a good blend of the sort of empiricism and all of the research and then my ideas. And, and we were sitting uh, outside having um, a drink at a cafe on Young Street. And there was a woman who was walking around and offering to read tarot cards. Like to, you know, tell, yeah. tell the future through tarot cards. Uh -huh. So he said, come over to our table. And I want you to read the future. And he asked the woman the question, should I write a book with this guy? Can you believe that? Is that <laughs> That's crazy? That's so awesome. That's such a great story. So she's putting out these tarot cards. Uh, and, and she says, yes, you should. And then he said, okay, my mind is made up. Oh, my God. That's wonderful. That's amazing. It's amazing. And, I mean, you know, we, we were – we were going to do it anyways, but I think maybe he was looking for reassurance or just he thought in that moment he could get some inspiration. <laughs> but it, it also shows some of the ambivalence and I think the, the way in which he was also protective of his ideas and the, you know, the, the fear maybe that if he wrote it with me, maybe I would be seen as the progenitor of some of these ideas when in fact they were really his ideas and I was very happy to to have him continue to be acknowledged as, you know, driving the bus in, in that way. Um, but he was worried about that. And and in, in spite of all of that, I think we were able to work together, write the book, and then the book kind of stands on its own. Right, 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 right. When you say he was worried about that, do you mean that this was actually a topic of conversation between you two? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that he felt that there were... Um, ideas that, that he had worked on, that, that he had propagated, and that he wanted to be seen as getting credit for. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. you know, I think, it, I think our relationship worked because there was a bit of a yin and a yang. I wasn't really interested in his ideas. Wow. In terms of attachment theory, no, I didn't really believe in that. It wasn't really where I was going. Uh -huh. So I wasn't a threat to say, you know, this idea about the interpersonal cycle, that's my idea. Jeremy didn't think about it like that. That would seem so false to me. It would be weird. So how was it for you to have to work or how much did you feel invested in the book called Interpersonal Process in Cognitive Therapy? I felt invested. I mean, I, I was very interested in it because I think that what it did was open up a door to concepts that I did believe in around the value of using this in treating personality disorders or looking at, at, at people who's straightforward, if you want to call that straightforward, although that doesn't really exist. <laughs> Treatment of depression was sometimes, or anxiety, was, was, was sometimes less than optimal mm -hmm. because people would be unwilling to change or people would be engaging in interpersonal cycles that unless they were interpretable in a therapeutic session may not be addressed, couldn't be assigned as homework, couldn't be made more explicit. Yeah. All of these ways of working, I think, seemed experientially real to me as aids in thinking more about how to deliver therapy effectively. Whether the background of all of his theories of attachment and this and that were true, it's sort of like, they're theories, that's okay. Um, yeah. and, and my own research was actually much more in cognitive psychology and looking at um, attention processing tasks. So we didn't really have a lot of overlap, which maybe I think allowed it to go forward. Very interesting. And by the way, I mean, you, you did a great career by yourself on mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. And it's interesting because Jeremy also had this, another side, which was the Buddhist side. Did yes. you in any way overlap at this time in this interest of mindfulness? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We did. I think, I think, um, I, I think he was a little bit more um, private about that. Um, you know, which I, I kind of understood. I think he worked with a, a Korean Zen Buddhist teacher while he was in Toronto. And, um, you know, we, we talked, I remember visiting him once in New York, and we, we talked about the nature of enlightenment and, and how that connects to what people might experience in psychotherapy. And, um, you know, by that time, I though. By that time, although I think we, we already sort of split geographically, he moved to New York. He was on a different path, you know, the move into psychoanalysis and, um, you know, 
more of that kind of worldview. So I, I would meet with him when I went to his wedding, but the contact seemed a little bit less and less. And then our, there was also Chris Moran, mm-hmm. who was, uh, you know, spent time with us in Toronto and, and continued to be a point of contact. Right. Mm-hmm. So how did you, I mean, after the time where you released the book, Uh, did you keep in touch afterwards? You said you went to the wedding, but in terms of uh, more professional or personal inter-influence, uh, kind of ev- each went in on their own way, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think his work took him um, more directly into a, a, a very productive and then sustained working relationship with Chris. Yeah. And uh, the work on alliance ruptures and... And, and my work took me into my collaborations with John Teasdale and Mark Williams. Right, 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 right. So I guess, you know, this was really great because you gave us such cool stories, you know, to get to know Jeremy a little bit better on that particular phase. I'm wondering if you wanted to leave us with any lasting, like, memory impression Jeremy had on you or maybe uh, something you remember. I learned a lot from Jeremy. And um, he was a little bit senior than I was when, when we met. He was a bit older. He'd accomplished a little bit more. And I think that our working relationship was always one of um, a kind of equality, um, interchange, challenge, ambivalence. But at the end of it, I remember in some ways when I would speak to him in New York City, we would look back and laugh at the times we had in Toronto. And I think part of that is that we, we disengaged from each other's worlds. So we could have that freedom to look back and say, you know, can you believe we said this? Or can you believe we did that? Or can you believe when we were at this conference, this person said this? And I really cherish those memories because I think that there was very little ambivalence, at least in our conversations to the relationship that we had that we could reflect upon. And I think that that actually, for me and for Jeremy, was, was very sustaining. I remember one dinner that we had in New York with Chris, and we spent a lot of it reminiscing, you know, not complaining and not um, dealing with worries, but just, I think, in a way, celebrating uh, the ability and the things that we did together. And I think that felt very positive for me, and I think it felt very nurturing for Jeremy. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I miss that with him, Yeah. even though it was, you know, very infrequent. Hmm. Zeno, thank you so much for this opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you for asking me. <laughs>